Joining us today for our webinar is Jesse Skittrell. Jesse is a board certified colorist with the American Board of Certified Colorists, and he's also a Bricado color um, team educator. And it's great to have Jesse with us to share the information. Um, I'm Gary Call, and I'll be manning the questions and answers and trying to type answers for you as quickly as I can. We look forward to hearing from you and to participating in this great new package of information. We're planning on between an hour and, and 90 minutes of information. So if uh, you're unable for some reason to stick with us the entire time, uh, remember we will be sending out a link to everyone that's registered. So you'll get the information in uh, real time and be able to view it on YouTube in the next couple of days. So without any further ado, Jesse, let's turn it over to you and take over and let us know about color in real life. Jess? Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I, I'm so thrilled to share this information, color in real life, because this is information that I really own. And this is really about us as the hair colorist behind the chair, own aircraft and taking it back and taking control of it. So let's just jump right into exactly what we're going to cover today. So to start off with our agenda, we're going to talk about tool selection first and foremost, why we choose what we choose and how we choose it, natural hair color categories, marketing, how to market what you're going to learn today and how to implement it into your salon, global hair color design guidelines. So these are really strong guidelines on when you're deciding on hair color with your guests and when you're composing hair color, how what, what specific things that you need to look at and gives you a formula that you can actually implement behind the chair. We're going to go over some real strong application techniques and demonstrate everything from beginning to end and then finish off with reviews and questions. One of the first things that I really like to point out about the content of this information is we're not talking about hair origami here. This isn't about 50,000 neatly folded foils that look pretty sitting on the head in some sort of duck fashion. Um, this isn't avant-garde hair color blocking. This isn't about you as the hair colorist. This is really about the consumer and what the consumer wants as a hair colorist. And for a long time now, there's been a big disconnect between what hair color manufacturers teach, because our job is to teach, here's how hair color works and here's how our brand works and how it's actually used within the salon. And I have to applaud Bricado for really taking this on as an opportunity to really say, this is how Bricado fits into the real life in the salon behind the chair. And here's how it's actually used. So I wanna share this. First and foremost, my, uh, for those of you that haven't met, my name is Jesse Skittrell and I am a hairdresser and I'm coming out as a hairdresser to you right now and I have a hair colorist. And I have a salon, actually two salons now, and we have 12 stylists in one and six stylists in the other. And 60% of our business is hair color. And I really want to share with you how we utilize not only Bricado in the salon, but how we utilize it in a real life situation. Because I think so often when we attend hair color classes or webinars, it's about tickling you as a hair colorist and getting you excited when this is really about how can you create profitability and productivity behind the chair. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So vitally, vitally important. My goal by the end of this is to get you thinking different about what you do behind the chair and to get you to talk about it differently and to approach it differently. And hopefully we can have that conversation again in 90 days and you're gonna see how this is gonna dramatically affect your color business. So let's jump in. One of the first things I like to say is really share, and this is a Sam Bricado quote, this is my all time favorite. I got the chance to spend some time with him in his salon a couple months back and he made a really great statement. Learn the rules like an expert so you can break them like an artist. We've all heard think outside the box and you know break the rules, bend the rules, but you really have to understand the rules like an expert and those boundaries are really what create creativity. Creativity comes from boredom and having to do things over and over in a monotonous fashion and that's where art artistry comes into place is breaking them like an artist. So the first thing I want to really address is the tool selection and by tool selection I really do mean the hair color that we choose behind the chair. One of the reasons I personally chose to play with Bricado is it's designed by a hair colorist and a salon owner. So everything is thought through from a hair colorist perspective. And if you ever question what something is for, just stop for just a second and think like a colorist. So rather than a corporation, it's really being designed to fit into the salon. So one of my favorite parts of working with Bricado 
is a simple, simple, simple inventory. There's not a ton of inventory. I don't have 120 tubes of hair color. I have exactly what I need and I know how to maximize my creativity and I don't have to overthink. And there's something that addresses everybody without multiplying itself. And I can choose to have all of the tools or I can choose to have less of the tools and have a single inventory option system. And really, that takes me to my next topic, which is it's a full range of tools. We have permanent, demi-permanent. I can take my permanent hair color and turn it into a demi-permanent or a semi-permanent color using my clear. Um, I have my, my powder lightener for on and off the scalp. I have my cream lights, which is designed for balayage. Um, so the list goes on. It's a very complete toolbox that allows me to address the real-time, real-life needs of my, my clients behind the chair. There's a tool for every technique. So the little bottle down there shaking, that's my all-time favorite, is cream lights. What I love about this is when Sam designed the hair color line, again, thinking from a hair colorist perspective, he designed the tools to fit the technique rather than the technique having to fit the tool. In the past, when those of us that have done balayage, have done balayage or ombre, we've had to take powder bleach and manipulate it into something that we can use behind the chair with, with limited success or moderate success. In this situation, we've created cream lights, which is an oil-based cream bleach that gives us that soft lift. So there really is a tool for absolutely everybody and for every technique that's out there. Seriously durable, shiny, long-lasting results. That really, I have uh, several clients that refer to it as color that cares for their hair. They really feel like the quality of their hair texture is, is improved. My all-time favorite is hair color ages up the chart, not off the chart. Now, as a hair color company, it drives me crazy when I hear hair color companies say, our hair color doesn't fade. Well, hair color, even natural hair color is going to fade. It's exposed to the elements, it's exposed to light, it's going to age or it's going to fade. What I love about working with Bricado is be the way that it ages, it ages up the chart. So a level five doesn't become a level eight gold, brassy, hot mess. It simply becomes a level six. So that's a, an acceptable age or fade, even in natural hair color categories, that I can work with rather than having it fade or age off the chart and become a brassy mess because of the durability. The key, key phrase we like to use over and over again is the tube you choose is the tube you use. There is a, a lot of creativity built into Bricado Color Project as well, but there is also maximum thought put into how that hair color works. So when you take a look at the color chart, the done level on level, so the underlying pigment is already thought through for you. So the tube you choose is the tube you use as long as you're working within two levels of where you're currently at. So what that means to me as a hair colorist behind the chair is I can spend more time being creative and art artistic because I'm going to spend less time overthinking. I don't have to think so much about what the finished result is going to be and matching the swatch and taking all these variables into consideration and celebrating the fact that I match the swatch. I can now be creative because I know the color is going to turn out the way that I need it to be. It's not porosity reactive. It's not going to be progressive by any sense of the word. The underlying pigments are taken care of for me. There's less overthinking that I have to do at the end of the day, which allows me more creativity in the long run and better durability and shine for my guests. Some of the latest technology has really been built into Bricado, and I really love that. I'm a technology hound. Um, I love to surround myself with technology. And some of the key components that really play a difference are things like LAO technology. I have yet to see this in any other hair color line out there, and it works really well in Bricado land. LAO technology is low ammonia odor technology. And for our salons, we didn't realize how spoiled we are until our manufacturer, our distributors come in and drop off hair color all the time and say, hey, play with this. And we'll mix it up and put it on swatches or mannequins. And that smell of ammonia really just knocks us over. By using LAO technology and color project, the low ammonia odor, it really neutralizes that ammonia odor fragrance, which makes for an unpleasant experience, but allows me the flexibility and of using ammonia in my product and still being able to get that great coverage and durability and longevity that I'm typically used to with ammonia products. The multi-pigment composition. So again, if you take a look at Bricado Color Project's color wheel, the colors that are placed closer to the center of the color wheel are going to be more pre-blended and brown and gray coverage focused. And the colors that are on the edge are going to be more pure tone or fashion shade oriented. So I have the choice of how creative I want to be and do I want to think about it a lot and use pure tone color or do I want to just simply 
get some great coverage and very simplistic and pull a tube of brown off the shelf. I have that creativity in one tube. The pyrazole technology, which is purely oxidative dyes that are built into the color. So for those of us that have been using color for a long time, there's two types of colors, there's oxidative and direct. In Bricado land, we use predominantly oxidative hair color, which is pyrazole technology, which gives us better durability over a period of time. That's why the hair color will age up the chart when exposed to the elements rather than aging off the chart. So your bright, vibrant reds don't become a brassy mess. They stay in the same color family that they're intended to be. And the color that cares with the emulsion oil technology, there's four key components to the base of the color, marumaru oil, green tea oil, extract, palm kernel oil, and macadamia nut. Marumaru oil and palm kernel oil um, are very topical moisturizing oils that work on the cuticle layer and keep the hair hydrated as well. Macadamia nut is a building, the building blocks of natural essential fatty acids or amino acids that actually goes in at the microfibers and macrofibers in the cortex of the hair and mimics that intercellular binding material or what we call moisture in the hair. And it really keeps that natural moisture factor that would deplete from over chemicalizing the hair or flat ironing, flat ironing the hair to death. Um, and it eliminates some of that. Green tea extract is a very strong antioxidant that prevents hair color from fading or aging. So we use hydrogen peroxide in our hair color and that hydrogen peroxide, it gives off an extra hydrogen molecule that stays active in the hair shaft no matter how much we shampoo. The green tea acts as a free radical eliminator and eliminates that for us, again, elongating the life of our color and eliminating that age and fade out of the hair. So it really is, at the end of the day, the best toolbox that you can possibly have to address it, which is really great when we talk about color placements or color techniques or getting creative behind the chair, because now I don't have to worry about making the hair color work. It just works on its own because it's all been thought through by Sam. So let's take a look at what are some of the tools that we can use it with. One of the first things that I really like to tell hair colorists is do not lose sight of your craft. It's vitally, vitally important that we gain sight of our craft and stop matching the swatch. There has never been a guest that came in and sat down in your chair and said, make me a level five. They don't do that. They walk in and say, I want to be dark brown. I want a chocolate. I want to have a light ash brown. They may say ash, they may say gold, but they don't use levels. So my, I encourage you to stop matching the swatch. That's vitally important. We give so much of our color away and we pigeonhole ourselves into, I have to match this level six. So what I want you to do is start thinking in terms of natural hair color categories. And this is derived from the American Board of Certified Hair Colors, for those of you that are familiar. So if you're ABCH, you'll recognize this. Please sit back for just a second. But it really paints a great picture of what you should do with your guests in, behind the chair when you do a consultation and helping them decide what colors are going to be the best choices for them. And what I'd really like to be able to speak to later is how to color for each of these categories. So let's talk about these categories. The key consultation question here is going to be, when you were a child and you went out into the sun, what color did your hair turn? What that's going to do for me is that's going to help determine, one, how that hair is going to lift, how easy it is, but also your tolerance for level changes or lightness or warmth or whatever the case may be is. So let me walk you through each category and describe this to you. The first category is going to be the B category. This guest could have been born blonde. Very unlikely, but she could have been born blonde and it changed so fast that she probably had to have pictures of it taken. Her natural level is between a level one and a level four. And when you ask her when she was a child and she went out into the sun, what color did her hair turn? She would simply say it got lighter brown. It did not have, um, it did not have a um, red tone to it or it did not, was not uncomfortable by any sense of the word. She also is the one that we play heck with when we cover gray because of the fact that the gray has such high contrast, so we expose too much of that warmth and she's the most uncomfortable in those warm or red tones in the hair. The second category is the W category, and the W category is warm brown. She could have been born blonde, she would have stayed blonde well into high school, and it changed very dramatically. And when she went out into the sun, 
and her hair lightened, she would simply say that it got warmer or it got redder. These are the ones that fake being redheads really well. Her natural level lives somewhere between a four and a six. And this is the preponderance of category that we work the most on. So um, we ha have a tendency to, when they go gray, it doesn't look really pretty on them. So we do a lot of gray coverage with them as well. The R category is the reddish brown category. When this client was born, more than likely they were born a redhead. And her natural level lives somewhere between a level six and a level eight. What happens as a redhead gets older is they get ashier and they get flatter and all they want is what they simply had when they were a little bit younger. They don't really go gray, they kind of go peachy. So you just want to mimic natural hair color characteristics in this category and keep in mind that deeper hair at the scalp and lighter and brighter and warmer on the ends is going to be the best choice for somebody like this. And then the last category is the S category, the soft brown category. This client was born blonde and she stayed blonde well into high school. When she went out into the sun, her hair got blonde, blonder, or blonder. She'll do anything she can to stay blonde. Her natural level lives somewhere between a six and a 10. This guest is the, is the bulk of what we do in the salon is some form of lightening to the hair. What's interesting about this is as you ask this question to your guests, it's really gonna help you understand what they're gonna be the most comfortable in. If you take a B category client and you try to make her a level six or a level seven, maximum warmth is gonna be exposed and she's more than likely going to be uncomfortable. Not that that doesn't happen, but it's very highly unlikely that she's gonna to wanna to be in that category. The same thing is gonna to happen to somebody that's in a W category. Making her a blonde is probably not gonna be in her best choice or her best interest or make her feel the most comfortable. So that'll help us determine how the hair is gonna live. What's interesting here to know is the levels that cross over. Notice that the level four crosses mm -hmm. over um, from the B category to the W category as well. And so we've all seen that level four B category that when it takes color, it gets a really cool result. That's because she's in the B category. There's that level four at a W category that always looks a little bit warm. We put four stroke seven, seven on her and it always looks a little warmer than it does on somebody in a B category because their category changes everything. The second one to look at is that level six. That level six crossover. Notice we always say high lift tint works ideally on a level six or lighter. Well, it works best on a level six on somebody that's in an S category. If you put high lift tint on somebody that's in a W category, that's a level six, even though they'll sit in the chair and they'll look exactly the same, that client that's in the W category is gonna be a hot brassy mess and not gonna be comfortable. So really take into consideration their natural hair color categories when you're designing hair color. And it's gonna make a huge difference to your success because more often than not, they're gonna to wanna to stay in that natural hair color category. All right, let's take a look at marketing. Marketing is a key important part when we talk about hair color and what we're gonna show you today. There is no magical promotion. That's the biggest deal. When I get asked a lot how you sell hair color or what's the big service promotion or what's the one time thing that you ran that made a huge difference to absolutely everything in your hair color land. Well, there is no promotion that works that way. It's a constant conversation with the guest and a focus on hair color. So with that being said, um, I like to share a couple of things. One of the things is how do we sell hair color? This is how you sell hair color to a hair colorist. We get turned on by bright hair color. Uh, we get This really only represents really about 10% of our clients in the salon, but this is what we think of when we talk about hair color. This is how it's sold to our consumer. So a big deal to take a look at is Let's talk in terms of what does that consumer look at? What is she being experienced against? And this is vitally important. Happy, healthy, shiny, dimensional hair color that's reflective and has a lot of movement to it. So why are we showing extremes to our clients when that represents only 10% of what's there? So we really want to make sure that we gear our conversation to the end user and to the consumer. So to illustrate my point, the words that you choose when you talk about hair color are going to be vitally important. The verbiage, I can't stress this enough, is going to be vitally, vitally important. So I'm going to illustrate that here really quickly. So 
here on the right, you're going to notice a piece of art. And what you'll notice about this piece of art is it's a black and white piece. There's lots of dimension. There's some negative space, some positive space. It's a little bit of an abstract, and it's a pen and ink. It's a piece of art. What I want you to do is compare and contrast that to this piece of art. Instantly, what you'll notice, one, is that you have an emotion. You either like this a piece of art or you don't like this piece of art, but you have an emotion. The previous piece of art, you'll notice, didn't create an emotion, although it was nice and it was balanced and it was aesthetically pleasing, it didn't create an emotion. Hair color creates an emotion. So here you'll see this piece of art with lots of color, lots of composition, lots of repetition that's going on. There's a small amount of negative space, but a lot of positive space, a lot of color going on, and a lot of texture. But what I really want you to pay attention to is the cute little teddy bear in the corner. Do you see the teddy bear? I'm going to guess most of you can see the teddy bear in the little corner. Great. Now what I want you to do is unsee the teddy bear. Can you unsee it? Just don't see it. What if I turn it over? Does it go away? It doesn't really go away. My argument, and this illustrates my point, is once you say something to a guest and you use a specific word, they can't unsee it. So I can't tell you how often in a salon I hear a new stylist say, or a fresh stylist will say, we need to put some darker pieces back into your hair, to which the client responds with, well, I don't want to go too dark. And then there becomes this back and forth. We whip out the swatch book and we get clarification. But the problem is there's already a negative connotation attached to going dark. The client's going to see it as too dark, no matter what. You can't unsee it at that point. So I encourage you to really choose your verbiage that you're going to use with color behind the chair. We need to add a little background. We need to add a little contrast to this um, and stop talking in terms of level. Start talking in terms of warmth. Start talking in terms of color as far as food is concerned. We hear a lot of chocolate brown. We hear a lot of warm brown. We hear a lot of espresso. Those are vitally important because they evoke emotions. And then you can begin to pare that down and you make the decision what level that is based off of their hair color category. So I hope that paints a picture for you that's a little bit different and you begin to talk differently about hair color behind the chair because it'll vitally make a huge important difference that, you're ver that you choose your words carefully behind the chair. One of the key phrases that I encourage you to do is quarter, at least on a quarterly basis is challenge yourself for 30 days to ask what is your, and right now it would be, what is your holiday hair color plan? Just like you change makeup, what is your hair color plan for fall, winter, summer, spring? And I challenge you to ask every single guest behind the chair that. I did this in our salon, and we had a 25% increase in our bottom line of our color when we did this with our, our guests. Because what ends up happening is more often than not, when we start this conversation, we think our clients are static and they want great coverage all the time at a level six you'll find that they'll want to make ebbs and flows and it gives them something to look forward to when they are booking hair color. So have a plan for what the next visit is outside of where you're at. And I'm going to show you three or four different ways specifically with a blonde that you can play this game. What is your, what is your um, fall, winter, spring, summer hair color plan? Vitally important. The other key thing in marketing here is to get the conversation, especially when you're going to be charging, is when you're doing these color placements and when you're putting these foils in, whether you put in two foils or 50,000 foils, make sure the hair that's left in between gets color on it. Even if it is color balancing or even if you're using zero, 00 clear on the hair just for happy, healthy, shiny hair, it's going to be vitally important that you cover everything because what begins to happen is the perception changes with the guests. She's going to think that $120, I'm just making up a number here, which is a whole bunch of foils and some clear stuff put onto her head, and she's going to sit in the corner for 30 minutes. And she's going to think that that's a value of $120, or whatever the dollar amount may be. So it's going to get you away from talking about those base colors and get you more into talking about those multidimensional colors and charging a little bit more for those colors. The other thing that's going to be vitally important is virtual portfolios. Throw away the hair books. Throw away the hair magazines. You will notice when was the last time a guest brought one in. 
they don't do them anymore. They are outdated the second that they hit your salon. And here's a big secret. The hair magazines use the same images for five to six different publications and they rotate them. There's nothing new there. So virtual portfolios are going to be your best choice. So if you just get on Google and Google ombre brunette, you're going to notice that they will categorize them at the top of it under images for you. So use your iPads, use your Pinterest is going to be a great one. And on your Pinterest, make sure you're putting your own images there. Use your Facebook. Every time you'll notice that clients are bringing in their phones more often than not and pulling them up. So create a virtual portfolio that you're, you can speak to and that you can pull off of and has ombres and has um, single process colors and has believable soft color like what we showed so that you can show your guests. It's vitally important that you have a virtual portfolio of some sort that you're pulling from. And then the last part about marketing is make sure you speak in consumer ease. It's very important that you make it easy for them. Great example, we're going to talk extensively about a service called Quick Lights and Accent Foils. These are two of the biggest money makers in the salon that are fast, quick, and easy um, for, for you to do in the salon. A Quick Light is a base color with up to 15 foils put into the head, and the Accent Highlight is up to 15 foils, foils into the head. And it, they're vitally important that you put them on your menu like that because right now, what we do is we put foil highlights or $2 per foil or $5 per foil or whatever the per foil charge is and we it doesn't become consumer friendly and therefore it becomes the forgotten service. So I want to show you a way that you can verbiage it on your menus that will make a huge difference. So the first two services you need to add to your menu are called quick lights and accent highlights. And I'm going to show you how to place those accordingly. All right. So. With that being said, here's some global hair color design guidelines that you want to plug into your brain that will make a huge difference to your success behind the chair. We've talked extensively in previous webinars about natural, believable hair color characteristics. If you've been on there, if you haven't, go check out some of our other webinars and we'll talk extensively about that. So I'm going to reference those, but I want to add to those guidelines as well. Some of the design principles that we have to take a look at are there's six basic design principles when you're do communicating with a guest when you're having a, a color composition or a look what I call a look you want to address a guest's look a look encompasses the haircut shape it encompasses the color it encompasses the makeup it even encompasses her clothes but start addressing her look and you're gonna have much more success than if you're addressing a haircut or if you're addressing a single process color because that allows the conversation to be a little bit more broad. There's six things that you look at when you're composing um, a look for your guests. The first one is form, and form is going to be the most vitally important piece. It's the haircut shape. Good hair color starts with a haircut conversation, and it's vitally important. And what you want to look at is, is the haircut shape graphic? Is it strong, one length, very Vidal Sassoon? Or is it soft? Is it got a little bit more movement to it? Or is it some sort of combination of in between? Because the color is going to naturally need to play against that. The second is function. Function is vitally important when you're having that conversation with your guests. Nothing drives me crazier than when the mom of six kids with the mid-length bob walks through the door and she says she wants to be a blown out double processed blonde. Well, the reality is that's not going to work for her, her lifestyle. So there's three basic things that you're going to look at in function. Utilitarian, invoking, and maintenance. Now what I mean by that is, what is the purpose of her hair? Is the purpose of her hair to invoke emotion and to create a feeling? Long, sexy hair that dangles in the wind and blows around. Is she using that um, to toss around? Or is it utilitarian? She has four kids and she's lucky if her hair gets washed and put into a ponytail. Which end of that spectrum is she really going to be on? Better yet, what is the maintenance of that hair going to be? You don't want to get a guest into anything that's going to be too high maintenance, and she's going to have to be there every four weeks. She may have the hankering to have that for the moment, but it's not sustainable in the long run. So you want to make sure that you have that maintenance conversation with them as well. So form, function. The third is line, and line is vitally important. Hair should act like arrows and point to the best feature on a guest. So again, this harks back to the form conversation. Hair should act like arrows and point to the best feature. So find what your guest's best feature is. 
and really play off of that. And I have found this works really well in the salon. Every guest has a good feature. Sometimes it may be her big toe and you have to wrap the hair around her and make it point at the big toe, but there's a good feature about every single guest. So Mrs. Gottschalks, you have really strong eyes. If we make these bangs just wrap around and hit right at your cheekbone and make these pieces land right here and we can layer amongst that, it'll draw all the attention to your eyes. There isn't a woman alive that wants anything drawn attention to her neck. It's very rare that you're going to draw attention to a neck unless she's a freaking swan. So hair should act like arrows and point to your best feature. Form, function, line. The third is texture. Texture is an interesting one because texture creates emotion. Do you know that women that have smoother hair are typically perceived as more sophisticated and less approachable than a woman that has curly hair? Curly-haired clients are, are perceived to be less sophisticated, but more approachable and fun. So you can create emotion using texture. Whether that's real or not, that's the perception of the public out there. So you can control your, your guest perception that way. But that also causes hair color to behave differently. So if you've ever highlighted curly hair and you get in there and you put in little highlights into the hair, in curly hair, it just has a tendency to disappear. So I'm going to have to treat that overly curly hair a little bit different and highlight probably in a bigger space or do some sort of balayage or ombre that's going to make a difference to that hair. Form, function, line, texture, and the last is color in that conversation. All of those things need to be considered first before I actually get to the color conversation. In color, it's very simple and it's the same rule that works with makeup. Light brings out and dark recedes. So if I have a guest that, had, that is worried about her jawline, and most women over 40 are typically worried about cutting their hair too short. You've all heard this. Don't cut my hair too short because it's going to make my face look fat and round. So if I take her hair, especially we're seeing it a lot right now with scarf weather, mid-neck length, that's pretty safe. And I can get some interesting movement to the hair and the haircut shape. But I can also add to that and say, Mrs. Gottschalks, if we just put a couple of drapes, and I'm going to discuss what a drape is, drapes of darker color behind your ears, it will narrow out what you're worried about on your neckline. And then we can put a couple lighter pieces right around the face and draw attention to your eye area. So we can take away from one and add to the other. Light brings out, dark recedes. Form, function, line, texture, color. Plug them into your brain when you're designing in your mind, and that's going to make a huge difference. And the goal here is to create a visual literacy for you so that you know what to look for when you're looking at a guest to help them be the best version of themselves. Because that's really what our goal is behind the chair is to help our guests be the best version of themselves. All right. So inside of that, now we actually get to the color conversation. Some color considerations that you want to take into consideration, first and foremost, is when you're designing is the color temperature. Do I want a cool, neutral, or a warm finish to this color and what or a combination of those? And again, her natural hair color category is going to dictate that for you. A client that's in a B category is probably going to be the most comfortable with things that are in a cool color temperature. Probably not as comfortable with things that are in a neutral temperature because she's going to feel warm to her and absolutely not going to be comfortable with anything in a warm temperature. A client that's in a W category is probably not going to want too cool of a result because it's going to make her look flatter and ashier and it's not going to be the best version of her. So what color temperature do you are you wanting to go for there? What color value? Meaning level of lightness or darkness. Now the thing that's vitally important here is when you're determining level with a guest or where they live at, when we say a guest is a level 5, that means a third of the hair on her head is a level 4 a third of her head is level five, and a third of her head is a level six. Those colors next to each other on average are a level five. So if I go in and make a client all one color on her head in a level five, it's going to feel very artificial to her. So what level of lightness am I going to use? So when you're determining your colors, make sure you're a minimum of two levels apart. So often I watch hair colorists go into the hair color and they put on a level 6, a level 7, and a level 8. The problem is those are so similar, the average finished result is going to look like you just may, might as well have put on a level 7. So make sure you're a minimum of two levels apart when you're making decisions, sometimes more for contrast. So again, the next one would be contrast. 
You, are you going to go high or low intensity with the contrast? Now here you want to be very careful because you can really outdo yourself. I can tell you from experience, I experienced this great hair color technique that was very well placed and it was very fluid and very blended and it used a level four very violet hair color with a level uh, nine very gold hair color and the two of them were high contrast and it looked like it was going to be all interesting. We put it onto the hair. The problem is, is they were so, so contrasting with each other and the tones were exact complements on the color wheel that they actually blended each other out and it looked like we just did a level six somewhere in the middle and it washed itself out. So be careful of contrast and going too extreme from one to the next and run the risk of making your client look like a candy cane when you're trying to be interesting and fun and keep it consumer driven. So there's five color accents that you want to think about when you're designing color placements in the hair. The first one is a reflecting accent. So you can see on our model here the golden piece that's right there in the very front, a reflecting accent is going to be something that's going to be a little bit lighter and it's going to be a little bit warmer and it's going to make, make something look bigger and brighter and bolder. An absorbing accent, and you can see those dark pieces that are just behind the lighter pieces in our model here where we have that little bit of violet red that's popping its head through a little bit. Those are going to be absorbing and less light reflecting and it's going to create contrast and it's going to push the light away from itself. So you can choose to have one or the other or both. A transitional piece is vitally important. So here in our model, you can see we have that copper red piece that's somewhere in between. So we have that really intense gold color. We have that really intense dark vi red violet color. Somewhere in between, we have that red copper color. And that gives us that transitional piece that we're looking for. This is vitally important, especially when you're working on those clients that are in that B category, that level one through four that really do choose to go blonde. If you go into that level three hair color and you put in heavy highlights into the hair and you get a pale pastel blonde, it's going to have a tendency to look gray. So by adding a transitional color that's a level somewhere in between without warmth or in a neutral result, maybe say somewhere at a level six, you're going to have a much more believable result than if you were to just put in the light and the dark creating that two-dimensional look. So think in terms of a transitional piece. A focus piece might be if she wanted a hot pink piece or if she wanted a gold piece or whatever the focus may be, something that's going to draw your attention. The challenge is as hair colors is we get color crazy and we start making our clients look like candy canes. My all-time favorite is the client that wants the blonde next to the red. What does blonde next to red look like? it has a tendency to look like stripes sitting on top of each other. Because blonde is lighter than red, natural hair color characteristics say that it should be on top of the hair because that's most where it's exposed. And red is a medium weighted color, so it would be underneath. So if you have a guest that wants to have a blonde and a red, sometimes you're better off to put the red in the interior of the haircut shape and the blonde on the top and let the red poke through and the blonde be the focus rather than putting them next to each other or create a focus piece of red rather than trying to make a statement and just creating a garish statement. And then last but not least would be our base or foundation color. So you can have a reflecting, absorbing, transitional, or a focus piece as well as a base or foundational color. You can have all five or you could have one or two of these pieces, but those are the typically the color accents that you're going to be working on. When you take a look at a haircut shape, those are the pieces that you're going to focus on. So some things to consider when we're talking about the actual placement. The first thing you want to consider when we're placing hair color is the skull itself. The skull dictates how the hair is going to fall. In Bricado, we use multi-plane as our system. And we have vertical marker points and horizontal marker points. So anywhere the head curves, the hair breaks. So you can see in the diagram here, this has been drawn out so that you have all of the break points of the haircut. Those are all going to be the curves of the head and those are going to be the break points where the hair is going to open up. So there's horizontal marker points where the hair is going to open up and there's vertical marker points. Wherever the head curves, the hair breaks. Vitally important. So look for the light. Because the curves are the most exposed to the light, they're going to be the lightest. So that's where we should naturally organically put the light. Wherever the head flattens out, that's where we should focus the low lights because that's the hair that's going to be the less exposed or what we call negative space in the hair. 
the negative space is as important as the positive space is going to be in the haircut. So color on the curve for maximum impact. I challenge you to take a mannequin and find all the curves on the head and put a simple slice or what we call a veil right on top of the curve of the hair and just only apply it on the curves of the head. You'll be surprised at how how much light you're going to expose and how few foils you actually do on the head by maximizing it by exposing it on the curve of the hair. The second thing to take a look at is the fabric. The fabric of the hair, whether it's curly or whether it's straight. I'm going to have to adjust my color placement accordingly. Again, we talked about that earlier. If I have a high intense curl, I'm probably going to have to do something that's a little heavier handed, a little thicker pieces to make it expose itself versus straight hair where everything is going to be very dramatic and very stated. And then the last is gravity. And gravity is vitally important because we need to take a look at a couple of different things. Number one, if the hair is under five inches, natural growth takes over. So what you're looking for is the negative and positive space. I want you to focus on the ends of the hair and where they're going to fall. That's vitally important, and that's what gravity tells us. If they're five inches or shorter, the growth pattern takes over, and that's the direction it's going to go. You can't fight it. You can't train it. That's the way it's going to go. If it's five inches or over natural fall, it's going to fall back into its space where it needs to live, and natural fall takes over. So think in terms of where are those ends going to fall, not necessarily where you're placing it at the top, and I'm going to illustrate that here in just a moment. So three things to consider in your color placement, skull, fabric, and gravity. With that being said, a couple of key things that are really important to understand are the breakpoints in the hair. The first one that's vitally important is what we call the apex. So if I put a comb flat on the top of the head, where the comb lifts off, that's going to be the apex. The apex is the highest point on the head. This is that one piece of hair that lives absolutely everywhere. This is the piece that falls in the front, the sides, and the back. If I just put one highlight on the apex, it spreads over the whole head, and she could walk away being a blonde. Vitally important. The second piece, if I put another comb on the back of the head where those two combs meet and intersect, that's the vertex of the head. That's the strongest curve of the head, or also known as the black hole of death. And remember we said, anywhere the head curves, the hair breaks. So this is going to be the strongest break point in the head, and the maximum color exposure is going to happen right there. So notice the direction of the hair, hair changes. So as we converse and we talk about marker points on the head and the break points, these are two of the strongest break points that we're going to have conversations about. So some placement considerations to really keep in mind is horizontal partings. Anytime I place a color placement, whether it's a big panel of color, a small veil slice, or whether I'm actually just doing some sort of color blocking. If I use a horizontal placement, this is going to traverse the flattest areas of the head and best use on the flats of the head. And this creates width in my design and creates broadness. So if I have a very narrow head shape, this is a great choice to use because it's going to create maximum width. This also disappears into the hair and becomes very soft and muted because the hair on the, on the surface of it lays over the top. And I find a lot of times hair colorists give away their hair color by working only in a horizontal fashion and they could, they're working too hard when they could work smarter. Vertical hair color, whether it's a veil, a panel, or a color block, when I apply it, creates a stripe-like effect in the hair. It creates elongation and makes things look a little bit taller and longer and it is the most dramatic and makes a definite color statement. So what you'll notice is vertical placements seem to come and go with hair color fashion. About every 18 months, the pendulum swings both ways. So you'll notice very soft, muted, blended hair colors are very in fashion, and there's the pendulum starting to swing the other way where we're seeing high contrast hair color, and vertical partings are going to become very important all of a sudden again for us in another way. Now what's interesting is haircut dictates your success. So I want you to visualize for just a second a one length haircut, bob right to the shoulder. If I come in and put foils horizontally across the top of her head, horizontally being, meaning parallel to the floor, across the top of her head, what's the finished result going to be? 
the finished result is actually going to fall very stripe-like because gravity takes over. And what's the finished result? Again, visualize where the ends are going to live, not where the scalp is going to live. Uh, because it's going to fall vertically over the sides of the head, I'm going to get a very vertical stripe-like look to the head, which is, was very popular in hair color fashion about a year and a half ago, not so much now. But if I take that same hair color placement and I cut that hair short under five inches, all of a sudden the ends live in the air and have a lot of volume and that horizontal placement is a lot softer and more diffused. Again, haircut dictates more your success with hair color than anything else. So you have to have that conversation first. If you think back to a great example for those of us that have been around for a while to in the 80s and 90s when we would pull hair color through a cap and then we would take the back of the haircut and cut the length off of the back of the haircut and we would be left with those little dots. Again, the haircut dictates absolutely everything. And the best choice for most hair color placements is diagonal partings. These are somewhere in between. These work best on the curves of the head. They show no start and stop lines to anything and they give a fluid movement to hair color and they blend. So it's vitally important that we pay attention to what is the finished effect that we're looking for when we're placing hair color on the head. Diagonal movements, diagonal part lines are gonna give us the softness, whether it's diagonal back or whether it's diagonal forward. All right, let's jump right into it. All of that is a nice big buildup to the application techniques. So I wanna walk you through a few application techniques. The first one is gonna be color correction. Very simple on the fly color correction. A simple retouch and how you can make a simple retouch more interesting. Balayage and ombre, these are techniques that are here to stay. They're not going away. They're, we're finding that they're less contrast than they were in the past. Accent foils, up to 15 foils. Quick lights, we're gonna talk extensively about. Shadow low lighting, vitally important, especially right now as we move into cooler months, we wanna be low lighting our guests appropriately without making them look like they've fallen off of the truck. Bumping the base, which is gonna become important again in the spring. And then finish off with curtains, veils, and drapes. And these are gonna be vital placements that you can use in the salon. So these are some of the, the tools that you can use really quickly in real life and in real time. So the first one I like to share is just color correction. I do a lot of color correction in the salon and this one came through this week. The guests at the end of the day want a believable result. I can't tell you enough create believable results, meaning deeper and cooler at the scalp, lighter and brighter at the ends, lighter around the face, lighter on the ends, cooler at the nape, and low light should dominate. That's natural hair color characteristics. That's what the color correction guest wants. They don't walk in and say, I want to be a level six. So I find that hair colorists grab the swatch. They find out what level the client is at. So here's a great example. This walked through my front door this week. This guest would have paid a million bucks to get her hair color where it needed to be. And we've had this happen a million times where the guest sits down, they have this type of hair color, and she says, I want it back to my natural hair color. We whip out the swatch and we start looking at her natural hair color, which in this case was a level six, and then we start going after trying to make that hair a level six. The problem is, again, keep in mind, a believable level six is one-third level five, one-third level six, one-third level seven. So you go in and make all of the hair on her head a level six, it's gonna be opaque and feel very artificial to her, and the first words out of her mouth are, this isn't my natural hair color. So let me walk you through, this was a simple process, and it was very simplistic to do. The first thing that I encourage hair colors to do is when you see horizontal color rings, now let me walk you through what this guest had done to her hair. She is in the S category, a level six, and she was blonde as a child, got very blonde on her own. She had darkened her hair, didn't like it. All of this was done at home. Lightened her hair to a very pale blonde, wore that for a while, and then darkened her hair with a, an intense over-the-counter red, which then faded up into what you see currently sitting here in front of us and had an outgrowth. Her boss sent her to the salon and said, get that fixed, I can't have you here until you look like you look like a normal human being. And so here she is wanting a believable result and her hair has been put through the ringer. So let me walk you through what we did. The first thing I encourage you to do is when you see horizontal bands of color like this, don't try to even them out. 
you're not going to get horizontal bands to look like a perfect level six scalp to ends. The only way to get them to look normal is to put vertical pieces in. So we used a color melt technique on her. So all I did is I took, I didn't want to disturb the natural hair color that's at the scalp because the goal is her natural hair color to become, grow out and the ends to mimic what's going on at the scalp. So we didn't touch anything at the scalp with permanent hair color. So we used a color melt technique where I took finger width sections horizontally all the way through the head and applied two different colors to the hair one all the way through, the next one all the way through, and then the third one, we would apply the dark at the scalp and the light on the ends. And I'll, I'll walk you through what we did. So the first thing I did was to do a vitamin C treatment on her hair. So I took peppermint scrub. This is a great way to get rid of any of that cuticular direct dye buildup that's in the hair. Took just powdered vitamin C. You can get it at GNC, Super Supplements, and mix it in a two to one ratio with peppermint scrub and applied it to the, that hair dry, put her underneath of a dryer for about 15 to 20 minutes, get it nice and hot, and what it'll do, that vitamin C is a strong antioxidant, is it will shove those direct dye over the counter box colors off of the hair, any minerals that are in the hair, and it prepares the hair shaft. Rinse that out really well with hot water, and then we followed it up with a shotgun treatment. So I wanted to equalize her porosity as much as I can. So I used constructor on her hair, applied constructor, let it sit for about three minutes, rinsed it off at the shampoo bowl, and applied more constructor and did that three times in a row. So apply constructor, let it sit for three minutes, rinse it, apply constructor, let it sit for three minutes and rinse it, and do that three times. And the cumulative effect of the protein in the hair equalizes the charge of the hair shaft. It will only bond with the damaged sites on the hair shaft. Left her hair in incredible shape. Brought her back to the chair, gave it a great drowning with um, 8X and then lightly dried it into the hair shaft. Completely equalized the porosity of the hair, took down the damage, giving me a great palette to work over the top of. So I was able to get more of a blonde, um, yellow blonde look to the hair so I wasn't trying to overcome so much of that funky red that's in the hair. So we mixed up two formulas in two bowls. One bowl had eight stroke seven one, which is a level eight dark blonde it's a violet-based brown with a, an ash secondary tone. I like to call it a minky finish. So again, your words. This has a, it's a dark minky blonde. So not too warm, not too cool. It's very balanced in the way it is. And we mix that up with a 20 volume. In the second bowl, I mix up equal parts of six stroke zero, six and neutral, six stroke seven five, which is a brown red at a level six, and six stroke three, which is a level six gold. So I have my brown, I have my gold, I have my little bit of red that I need in the hair, and a secondary brown on top of that with activating cream. So I'm looking for opaqueness from the permanent hair color and, durab and ease of transition by using the activating cream. So we just went through the head in a horizontal placement, took a lar large sections about the width of my finger, and we applied the eight stroke seven one with 20 volume to one section, just staying off of the regrowth line where her natural was. Then alternated with the second formula on the second one. On the third foil, we would use the level six on the, on the mid shaft and then the level eight seven one on the ends and just rotate that throughout the whole head. Processed completely, took her back to the shampoo bowl, rinsed it, and then we did a color glaze over the top with eight stroke zero eight and demi permanent just to harmonize and marry everything together to make it intensely shiny make the make it all feel very good make it all reflective and marry that scalp color with the end color and here's the finished result it's a believable result that walked out the door three hours after she walked in the door with that hair color um, she didn't want to see the finished result until it was completely dry and done, and she was shocked. She was very shocked that she was able to get this kind of a result to the hair. Of course, we sent her home with Pure Indulgence Shampoo, Viber Color Treatment, and 8X was her, her recommendations for home. Simple, easy hair color. Again, a believable result. It's going to be close to her natural hair color. It's not exact, but it's dang close to her natural hair color. Puts her back into her natural hair color category and I charge her an arm and a leg for that. So there's step one. That's probably the most common color correction that we come across in the salon every single day. Hair is either gonna to be too light, too dark, too warm, or too cool. 
and that vitamin C really makes a huge difference mixed with peppermint scrub. Okay, then that takes me to the conversation of color application. One of the first things that I tell people in a simple color application, check yourself before you wreck yourself with Bricado. You can see here in this color application how I was applying and the tips of the brush were actually bending away. So because of the unique properties of Bricado with the oil-based technology, it liquefies when pressure is applied to it and it's very thin in consistency. So you're actually, fit where you've been able to do that with cream hair color in the past, you can't do that with Bricado. You want to apply it a little bit differently because you're taking it off. So if you're getting hot roots, lack of coverage, shallow results with Bricado, it's probably your application nine times out of 10. So check yourself before you wreck yourself. Don't bend the bristles. You want to drop your elbow and apply the color in a tap and seal motion. You can see how I'm not actually pressing too much. I'm just tapping and sealing the color over the top of the hair. And it's going to make a huge difference to your retouches when you're doing that. And as you work down the head, you're going to apply in thin sections about the width of your tail comb um, through, the, you know, obviously working through the front, working through the back, work side to side movement down the back of the head. Don't what work one whole panel because if I have to remix hair color and it's slightly different, it's more acceptable for it to be a different color from mid crown down than it is for it to be different from left to right. So there's one. Number two is when you're doing deposit type colors, specifically like gray coverage, start the believable hair color application. D apply your retouch just like what we were talking about here and I want you to turn your brush vertically as you begin to drape those sections back down and dry brush that, hair, that color down a little bit. Just turn your brush vertically and take the hair color from the retouch and just go down the length of the hair shaft and drag some of that color down. What that'll do is it eliminates the rings of hair color retouch and it gives me a deeper and cooler result of the scalp the color ages and gets a little lighter and brighter at the ends. And what you'll, you'll know you're doing it right when your single process clients begin to tell you, it looks like I have highlights because you're dragging that color out, especially when you're doing gray coverage. It works beautifully and then it begins to start that balayage multidimensional conversation. That's something they can't do at home. They can put on a retouch and they could probably get a beautiful color out of it, but they can't get that balayage multidimensional type of look. Uh, thank you, Marty. I appreciate the kind words. Um, secondarily, and this is one of my favorites, it's a really great way to do a ticket builder. So there's two types of ways that you can build your services behind the chair. There is an add-on service, which takes more time, and there's a ticket builder. A ticket builder is, is meaning I don't have to take more time than what's currently there. So I like to offer my clients what I call a 3D color meaning I'm going to add 15, we add $15 for a second set of color to the bowl. So I'm going to do a gray coverage client and her typical formula is five stroke zero or five N and 20 volume, five N, six N, seven N, whatever the case may be is. I'm going to mix up two, maybe three bowls that are going to be in similar families. So one bowl is going to be five zero and 20 volume. One bowl will be five stroke seven one and 20 volume and one bowl will probably be five stroke three and 20 volume or five seven seven your choice and as I do my retouch I'm gonna do my typical retouch and in one section I'm gonna use five zero in the next section I'm gonna use five seven one in the next section I'm gonna use five three and I'm gonna alternate between those and I do that about every second or third service making sure that I give it that balayage style application and what you'll notice is there's a slight holographic difference to the color that makes it look a little bit more interesting than just a traditional single process color. It looks more complicated to the guest as well and I'm able to add a fifteen to thirty dollar add-on on top of that and do that every second to third visit and make it okay with the guest. And the conversation will go like this, Mrs. Gottschalks, this time we're going to do that. Next time we'll just do a single process color with one color and then we'll come back to that. And you flip flop back and forth. And you get a very interesting finish to the hair color that's not easily replicated at home. And I can ticket build with the guest and it's more interesting. So some single process simple application techniques. Of course, balayage and ombre. If you haven't had the opportunity, 
check out our um, webinars. We have a full webinar where I do balayage and ombre on my lovely little mannequin here. There's some definite tricks to it. It's worth learning. It's a, it's a tool and a technique that's going to be here for a, a long time because it mimics natural hair color, deeper and cooler at the scalp, lighter and brighter and warmer at the ends. Now we're finding that balayage and ombre, where it was very high contrast over the last couple of years, is becoming very low contrast and very soft. And we're even doing it a little bit with color. Cream lights in Bercado is going to be a beautiful tool to do this with. But I'm finding I'm doing it a lot with color, where I'll take the permanent hair color, mix it up accordingly, and I'll put in the color thickener in a very heavy way into my color and create a thick pasty substance that I can balayage or ombre right over the top of my existing color. So a great example of that, if I'm doing a single process color, retouch, and I want to balayage or ombre using color over the top, let's say I'm retouching her with a level 5 or a level 6, I can take 7 stroke 2 is a really great example. I'll mix it with 40 volume in a 1 to 1 ratio and put a fair amount of thickener in and I can just brush that over the mid lengths and ends using the balayage application workshop and get a nice soft finished refined look to those ends that's not too high contrast and is very believable and has little, if any, warmth built into the mid length end. So balayage and ombre, if you're really looking to master that technique, check, take a look at that workshop. It's definitely one of those skills that needs to be put into your base. We're doing a lot of base color right now with balayage and ombre, um, so I encourage you to build that into your menu as well. The biggest money builder in an add-on service that I find build, works really well in the salon, and I encourage um, new hair colorists to really wrap their arms around this because what I find is new hair colorists to the industry typically get so excited and enamored at the fact that they learned how to foil that they put in these back-to-back -back foils and create these intense over-the-top blondes that are very high maintenance. And my argument is, is it's very difficult once you become a book stylist like myself to find time to do a client like that. It becomes difficult over a period of time, but it's very easy for me to find 15 minutes to 30 minutes on my books to do something like this. So here's the conversation. We call it an accent foil, you could call it a spot foil, you could call this facial framing, whatever the case may be is. Most salons in a less than a partial foil, basically, that's what we're talking about, will do a per foil charge. $2 a foil, $10 a foil, $5 a foil, whatever the case may be is. That means nothing to the client. The client doesn't get that. So what I encourage you to do is create an accent foil, spot foil, or a facial framing that is up to, and pick the number. I find the sweet spot is about 15 to 18 foils. And that's, I'm going to show you the placement here that's going to make a huge difference to you um, that you can do with 15 foils or less. So an accent foil costs this much. And overprice it just slightly because this is the, the biggest service that gets added on in the salon. And the reason you want to overprice it just slightly is because I want to be able to say, Mrs. Gottschalks, you're in my chair, you're here for a haircut, you know if we added a few highlights right around your face, that would cost you another $55 and it would really bring out your eyes. She's either going to say yes, and you have another $55, or she's going to go, uh, that's kind of expensive for my pocket to which you can then offer the discount on it. And you can say, you know, let's take 25% off of that, and but the value is still at $55 since you're here, you're a good client. And it allows you the room to still be profitable and back down off of it and use it as an add-on service. Because the reality is, if you think about it, how long does it take you to put in 15 foils? If you're doing a foil a minute, which is slow, that should take you 15 minutes. Can you find an additional 15 minutes in your day? I find I'm doing a lot of accent foils on guests with 15 foils or so, and then I'll hand them off to somebody else in the salon to rinse and blow dry that aren't necessarily busy and gives them an opportunity to interact with another guest and the guest finds it very accommodating. Obviously it's better off if you can get them in that day, but if you can't, try to get them in as quickly as you possibly can. So. A couple of key things to keep in mind with accent foils is count out the amount of foils. When you set up your tray or your cart or your workspace, count out the 15 foils. Because what happens if you just put a pile of foils there, 
and you start going, you're going to end up putting in a partial foil because that's what we do. We just keep going until the hair's covered. And next thing you know, you're giving away a partial foil for what should be an accent foil. So count out 15 to 18 foils and put them in. So here's the color placement that's going to work really well. So in the far right-hand corner here in the presentation, that bold line at the top of her head that's at marker point one is her center part line. You can move the part line accordingly. It doesn't make a bit of difference from side to side. What you're going to do is you're going to take a slice right off of the part line. So you're going to take it off the part line and move it out of the way. And you're going to put a foil directly be beneath that. You could weave it. You can slice this. You could make big chunkies. You could make little subtle blends. You could do this in balayage, but that's where the first one is going to be placed. You're going to place it there. And then the negative space or the subsection underneath that, and you're going to move that one out of your way. So flip it over. The negative space that's directly underneath that is going to be a pinky width away. So you're going to lay your pinky down, part that hair out, and clip it up out of the way. Lay in your next foil horizontally directly beneath that. Apply. You're going to fold that foil out of the way, and you're going to leave a negative space or subsection directly beneath that that's one finger width, your, your forefinger. Part that out of the way. Apply your next foil. You're going to lift that hair out of the way, and you're going to use your thumb as for your next subsection. Part that hair out of the way for, to create the negative space, and then place your next foil. That's literally four foils tops from the part line. So you have four, three to four foils on either side of the head, and you just basically butt the, part, butt the foils right up to the part line and then space them out the further you go down the head. Now on the side of the head, you can see that there's three foils. So there's one that's right at marker point two, right at the precision of the head. That's from our previous work done on top of the head. And I'm working from the top down, not the bottom up, because that hair is processing already. So traditionally in a full foil, I would work from the bottom up because I can get that client into the shampoo bowl. In this situation, I'm going to work from the top down. Now on the sides of her head, I'm going to place my first foil diagonally from marker point two to marker point three over the top of the ear. The next one is going to go from marker point two to marker point three, but at a less of a diagonal, and it's about a thumb width distance apart. Now you'll notice you're getting kind of tight because everything's landing at marker point two. So that last foil, you're going to pull away from marker point two about an inch and a half to two inches, and it's going to traverse at a slight soft diagonal to the back of the head, and you can see that at the bottom of the foil where it hits the corner curve of the head. What that does is it's your transition piece. That keeps her from being a blonde coming and a brunette going. And that gives that piece directly behind the ear a panel of color that falls directly behind the ear on most haircuts. Now on that crown, you can see we're placing a horizontal foil right at the apex and then two foils that dissect it and land right at the vertex. So that gives me highlights that travel over the curve of either side of the corner of the head and one that's right at the top of the apex and encompasses the vertex of the head. So again, 15 foils, I'm going to be able to encompass the whole head and get her where she would be naturally highlighted on the hair would be around the frame of the face, heavily on the part line, and it would diffuse as it goes through the occipital. This is the biggest money maker in the salon. I can't tell you if you just sell one to two accent foils to your guests in the salon, you're going to have much better success um, with building your ticket throughout the day than you are trying to do back-to-back -back foils or that full head bleach and tone. So let's take it a step further. I highly encourage you to add quick lights to your, to your services. And a quick light is an addition of an accent foil over the top of a base color. So here's how it goes. When your guest books for a simple retouch in the salon, She's booking for those re that regrowth to be done. That costs, I'm going to just say $65, $55, $75, $100, whatever the case is. That's a simple retouch. We're going to apply the retouch. So how many of your clients want a retouch with highlights? I would say the bulk of our clients are great coverage with highlights. That's what we want to do in the salon. But they don't necessarily need a full partial. So what most colorists are doing is they're putting in their foils or their partial foil 
and then they're trying to squeeze color into the regrowth in between those foils. The, fo the hair that's being foiled in those highlights is coming up beautifully at the scalp and then kind of orangey on the ends and then, oh my god, I missed a little bit of gray. So it creates kind of this Maalox moment. Nowhere in time has it been said that you cannot put lightener over the top of hair color. Tabitha doesn't know what she's talking about when she does that on Tabitha's salon takeover. You can absolutely put lightener over the top of hair color. Coming from the American Board of Certified Hair Colorists, it's called a tone on tone. So apply your retouch. It's going to take you maybe 15 minutes. This is, you've done this client forever. 4050-6070. You're going to apply your retouch. Have your foils and your lightener already ready to go. And then you're going to put on your 15 foils following the accent foil pattern right over the top of wet hair color. All the lightener is going to do is shove the hair color through the process. So you're going to notice it'll go through. It'll all of a sudden turn kind of this purple or orange or whatever the case may be is, and then it starts lightening. The color that you're applying to at the scalp will lighten at the same rate that the mid lengths and ends are that you're highlighting. So you won't get that funky off tone. If you're working on particularly dark colors, maybe a three or a level four, and you're trying to do a quick light, what I would do is when you go to apply the foil, use a dry brush and just kind of pull off any little bit of excess color that might be in the foil, and then put your lightener over the top of it. Process it all together, and you get really good at gauging how fast your lightener comes up in that 30 minute window of retouch time. Worst case scenario, you have to pop your client under a mild amount of heat just to get that pop of lift to make sure that they lift. You may want to use, if you think you need 10 volume, you may want to use 20 volume. You may want to just go a little bit more aggressive than what you think you need to be. If the hair is really fine, you probably don't need to be that aggressive. And put quick lights on your books. Now, a quick light is a 30 minute application. Most of us are booking a 30 minute application for a retouch. It really is only taking us 15 minutes to apply it. So if it's taking us 15 minutes to apply it, we really end up having 15 minutes of kind of dead time. So you have 15 minutes to put on that accent foil over the top of it and build in a quick light. I can charge more for that. Now the reason you want to put this on your menu is because the guest needs to be able to articulate it when they call and book the appointment. So you're the, you need to educate the guest. Mrs. Gottschalks, this time we're going to do a simple retouch, a base color, foundation color, whatever you want to call it. On your next visit, what we'll do is we'll do a quick light. And we'll just do that every second or third visit. That's going to cost a little bit more. So there's a little investment now, but not as much of an investment later. And on, a new, on your next visit, we'll just go back to doing a simple retouch. And then we'll just flip-flop like that. So the, re, the front desk knows to mark out the same amount of time, 30, 30, and 30, or 30, 30, and 45, depending upon what your haircut finish is with that. So you can take a client in between, because nothing's more irritating than when the front desk girl hears, I need a retouch with highlights. She marks out a retouch, and then tries to, tries to find time for a retouch, and then tries to find time for a partial foil, which you don't have in your day, and all of a sudden, what really should take 30 minutes to apply is marked out for an hour and a half to two hours, and you end up losing money and opening up your books. So it's just a great way to articulate it. You can charge a little bit more, and the clients get involved in it. So add accent foils, spot foils, fra facial framing, and quick lights to your, to your menu. This is one of my particular favorites in the salon, and this is one that we'll probably be doing a lot of right now is shadow low lighting. And I apologize for the quality of the images that are there. Um, they're drawn from a PDF of images. So shadow low lighting is if you have a guest that's been heavily highlighted in the salon for the summer or for the spring or whatever the case may be is, and now we're getting into fall and we need to get a, go a little bit darker. And the first word out of most hair colorists' mouth is that they want to begin to low light the hair and extend the low light all the way through the ends. Well, you get into the hair and you put in all these cute little low lights in the hair and um, they extend all the way to the end and it looks very artificial. And the hair actually looks a little bit dirty and flat and it's not very dimensional because it doesn't follow natural hair color characteristics. 
So what I would encourage you to do, now this is a gray retouch client. She's been colored with just a single process blonde and there's no dimension to it whatsoever. What I would encourage you to do is once that client comes in, whether it's a highlight or whatever the case may be is, is to maintain a little bit of shadow. So if it's a highlight guest, you're going to bring her in. You're going to do your highlight retouch just like you would consistently do. Apply your highlight retouch. The base color in between those foils, the negative space, what you're going to do is split the difference between her outgrowth, let's say it's a natural level 6, and the ends, which are going to be a 10. You're going to split the difference and create a transitional color, like a level 8. So you would pick out a level 8 neutral would be a great idea. Maybe add a little bit of warmth to it in a demi-permanent hair color. So once you've applied your highlights to the hair, you go through the subsections between or the negative space and starting at the occipital, you would apply that demi-permanent color from her natural line of demarcation three qu quarters of the way down the hair shaft, leaving the ends lighter and a little bit dry. So dry brushing it. So you're re quintessentially creating a level six that becomes a level eight, that becomes a level 10 in between the foil. And you're going to come almost all the way down the mid lengths and ends at the occipital. In the mid-range section of the head, you're going to do the same thing, but you're going to only come down about halfway down the subsection. On the top of the head, you're going to do the same thing, but you're only going to focus on the last third of the head closest to the scalp and let that highlight process in between. So what you've just done is you've created background in the subsections rather than actually creating a low light that goes from scalp to ends. So a great journey for a blonde is to bump her base and take her very blonde for the spring and summer, do some shadow low lighting during the fall, and as you move into winter, that's when you begin to start adding the definite low lights that travel through the hair and take her back into being blonde again. So it creates a real process. So here's a visual of that. So on this guest, we did nine stroke three six. This is her existing color. We did nine stroke three six, which is a level nine gold beige and very soft muted gold with cream activator. So we use the permanent color with the cream activator just because we want to create deposit in the hair. I did the exact technique I was talking about, applied it to scalp, pulled it through mid lengths and ends in every other section, but left the ends a little bit dry. So it was a little bit pale. And the finished result, even though the, the haircut looks a little bit dated, you can see that little bit of shadow on the scalp that gets a little bit lighter towards the mid lengths and ends and creates a believable look. This is really what our guests are looking for is believability. So with your blondes right now, I encourage you to create that shadow or that background in the subsections using demi-permanent hair color that you can easily age or fade into the spring rather than sticking traditional low lights in the hair and having to darken the hair. Here's a great example of bumping the base. I love bumping the base. So this guest is in the S category, and she is a natural level, let's see, what was she? An eight. She was a natural level eight, and we were lightening her. So I used 11 stroke six, high lift tint, so I'm bending and breaking the rules here, and two parts of 10 volume, and we're just applying to, this, to the outgrowth line of demarcation and just lightly feathering over anything that's dark and dragging it through a little bit. She's been very heavily highlighted and the ends are somewhat compromised on the mid length ends. There you can see the actual result from the bump to base. Now, when I do this, people always go, oh my God, that's warm and it's brassy. Well, the thing is, is it's really not one, it's the scalp. It, we're looking at wet hair color here. And two, we're looking at it against bleached hair on the ends. That's pale yellow that's been blown apart. And so I'm going to show you how to create contrast in the hair. So then we went through and foiled her hair heavily back to back, no subsections in between, after we bumped the base. And we used their powder lights with cream activator at the scalp. And here you can see I'm applying it and just showing some sensitivity to the previously lightened hair and hitting those dark spots as we go through. And I have a second formula of curl interrupted treatment with zero zero clear to put on those ends because our goal here is to have pale blonde scalp to ends but I need to fill that hair with something to make it shiny happy and healthy and the zero zero clear does that fold up to the line of demarcation and then fold over to secure the packet to keep the two of them off of each other so that's my really pale pale blonde 
Um, then we subsection out into the next piece. And here I'm applying 11 stroke six with 40 volume. So we get that pale golden blonde. And then on the mid lengths and ends, I'm using nine stroke three permanent hair color with cream activator because I want that color to be, uh, we all know that high lift tint doesn't lift to pale yellow. Again, fold to the line of demarcation and then fold over the top of that. I want this to be a gold at the scalp and then gold on the ends. I have to add some warmth back into those mid lengths and ends before I can actually begin to move forward and secure those. So I have one blonde that's really light, pale, and pastel, and one that's going to be a soft, golden, beige blonde to the finished result. Now I've saved my lightener, mixed it with a little shampoo. The last five minutes, I've pulled the foils. So you can kind of see the variegation there going a little bit. And what I'm going to do is take the lightener and just gently brush it around those fine hairs. Again, natural, believable hair color should be deeper and cooler at the scalp, lighter and brighter at the ends, lighter around the face. And here we can apply it lighter around the face and just let it sit for the last five minutes and it will soften that line of demarcation, especially on those heavy, heavy blondes that we like to do. And this is the finished result. So we applied on the bottom at the nape from Mark, horizontal marker point C from the occipital down, we did two high lift tints to one powder lights. In the midsection of the hair, we did one high lift and one bleach. And then on the top of the head, we did two powder lights to one high lift tint and processed that all together. And you can see the finished result is a believable, really light, pale, pastel blonde, which would be really great for spring and summer for your clients that are in that S category. Now, if she was a level seven, uh, excuse me, a level six in the W category, I would not bump her base. And I would not do that around her face. She would be an orange hot mess. So you can see how understanding the natural hair color category helps me move them up and down the scale of comfort and create a range of what they're gonna be comfortable in. Okay, so last but not least is curtains, veils, and drapes. So I want you to think in terms of curtains, veils, and drapes. If you have veil or sheer, it's a very thin, lots of light transfers through it. That would be a slice. One slice, an eighth of an inch piece. This is so thin that you can read newspaper through it. A lot of light goes through a veil or a slice, and it's very thin in consistency. A curtain is going to be three of those slices back to back, much more of a panel. So when you put your curtains up, a little less light comes through but you definitely can tell that the color is going to be there a little bit more. Versus a drape, which is five slices back to back. When you have drapes, drapes block out all of the light and they make maximum impact to the hair. So think in terms of curl of curtains, veils, and drapes on the hair when you're designing color placements in the hair. So I'll give you a great example of that. Here's our guest. We colored her whole hair and with eight stroke four three, 20 volume at the scalp and 30 volume on the mid lengths and ends. You can see the finished result. On the top of her head, we did two triangles that are just veils. So these are just simple slices, one slice, horizontally, two triangles that meet together at the apex of her head. So you can see that horizontal one right there at the front. And then it all meets at the apex of the head. There's simply six foils. The last one is actually at the vertex of her head, and it's two triangles that meet. It's not a whole section that's colored. It's just a simple veil of hair of color, and we use cream lights and 20 volume. You can see the finished result to the hair. And so, again, remember we said if I put lightness on the apex, that piece of hair color travels all over the head, especially when you're taking a look at this haircut shape. It's going to behave a little bit differently than if I just spread throughout the whole head. Most people would achieve this with tons and tons of foil. This is really truly achieved with only six foils in the head or six veils of color over the head. And what's interesting about this is how the curl affects the finished result of the hair. What's going to happen to this when she wears her hair naturally curly, which is her pattern, because of the heaviness of the placement, it's going to outline the curl as it, as it flew throughout the hair and give it some interest and intrigue. So this is our last piece with curl uh, with curtains, veils, and drapes. So here you can see our model Kristen before. This is our cover girl. And we 
took a oval shaped parting just behind her hairline all the way back to her occipital and we applied four stroke five five and cream activator scalp to ends because we want that deep cool result so we have this one's going to have three to four different colors going on it once we had that applied we took a triangle shape starting at marker point one traveling all the way to marker point six at the occipital in the very back at the top of that oval and in that section in that triangle shaped section we applied eight stroke four three copper gold and 20 volume the hair in between the two other colors we applied six stroke four five a level six copper red and 10 volume so we have four five five on the bottom nice cool red six stroke four five in the middle it's a transitional copper red to eight stroke four three which is a copper gold on top so we have three different choices we're making quite the color statement here now the interesting thing is where all of those meet are on the curve of the head so we applied a veil right at the transition spot so where the four stroke five five is and the six stroke four five meet you can see where we have a foil there of just a veil we followed that from front to back where the six stroke four five met the triangle on the top of the head with the eight stroke four three copper gold we did a curtain of three slices back to back at that transitional spot. Again, keep in mind, take a look at where those breakpoints fall are going to be in the curves of the head. So literally, we have four foils on the whole head. Okay. So here you can see the triangle at the top has been applied. We have the curtain applied on either side of the piece. And inside of that veil and that curtain, we did a combination of 11 stroke 3 high lift gold and 044 copper so with 40 volume i wanted a lot of ammonia in the color to punch through that hair cuz she has fairly coarse hair and i but i want a copper punchy bright result to the hair but i used a color melt technique so i applied cream lights with 20 volume on the mid lengths and ends of each of those veils and curtains so they had bright, bold copper that got a little bit lighter and brighter on the finished result. That's our finished result. Literally three sections of color with a curtain and a veil applied in between and a color melt. Took 20 minutes to apply. I would charge easily $150 for that just the color portion of that to a guest. Now when she gets retouched, the retouch colors, I don't, because the durability of Bracado is so insanely incredible. What you're going to notice is you only have to retouch the base color, so it's going to be a single process charge. So she's not going to pay $150 every single time. She's going to pay $150, and then she's going to pay for a retouch charge on the next one, and we'll do that two or three times, and then we'll change our color plan accordingly and come right back to where we were in the beginning. So you can see we're using the curves of the head where the maximum lightness is going to be, the flats of the head are where the hair is going to be low lighted. You can see we have created a transition color, we have a reflecting color, we have an absorbing color, and we have a foundation color that goes with this that gives us a lot of zing and pop in the haircut and it pops off the haircut and the haircut is played to her face. So there you go guys. There's a lot of stuff that's been handed out a lot of information in an hour and whatever we've done here for a time frame. Curtains, veils, drapes, quick lights, accent foils, balayage applications, single process colors, bumping the base. I encourage you to think about what you're going to say, how you're going to say it with your guests. Thank you for your time. Thanks, there Jesse. You. That was awesome. It was great to hear the information. Um, as you can tell, this is something that Jesse's doing in real life in his salon. And the actual information, the concept of color in real life, came about as we were teaching a series of color classes and answering questions and hands-on events and hands-on experiences. We wanted to go back and we wanted to share the real techniques that are being used by, by real stylists in this salon, rather than something overly dramatic or something that's difficult for you to actually perform. Hope you enjoyed the time today and hope that you will always come back and join us again for our next webinar. The next webinar will be in December, um, always the second Monday of the month, 
always at one o'clock central time. Thanks for being with us.